first foundation. For what they call a think tank, Lieutenant. What did he think about? Some operation called the Special Projects Fund. What's your worst conceivable sin? You thieving bastard. Not getting what I want. The best job he could find would be in the blackmail business. A dollar for guns. A dollar for you. Secret guns for secret friends. What are we going to do about all this? We're going to take care of each other. That's where you begin to die. I think that's why he was murdered. I don't think I'd like you on my trail. I'm implying that you murdered the man. Ah, I sense a trap. Here we try to design perfect plans. It's a perfect alibi. Frank really did that last night. How can I even begin to make a case with an alibi like that? We really don't like one another. Damn nation to our enemies. Would you agree with me on that? I think I'd have to agree. Oh, what a delight! Friends, this episode, although universally despised by Columbineers, is one of my personal favorites. While not technically one of the best, I return to it over and over for the uniqueness of its world, the subtlety of its themes, the excellence of its confrontations, and the way it balances its wacky comedy moments with a surprisingly hard-edged performance by Falk. The plot, in which rogue Colonel Frank Braley is misappropriating funds to enrich himself via illegal arms sales, arms transfers, was obviously inspired by the Iran-Contra scandal, which broke just a few years before. Rogue American military officers were popular villains during this period. See General Brad Whitaker, the arms-dealing Bond villain of 1987's The Living Daylights. Pickett's Charge was up Cemetery Ridge. Pickett's Charge. Cemetery Ridge. Not Little Round Top. Little Round Top. Braley himself is sort of an international man of mystery. I'll need to see the Dalai Lama before my trip to Tibet. Even doing the hidden tuxedo thing we see Bond do in Goldfinger. Although here, Braley is wearing a full tuxedo beneath a red jumpsuit, beneath his stealth gear. How hot and sweaty must he have been? Now, he's not exactly the suave, elegant bad guy we're used to. With his pleated pants and lame blazers, he looks more like an 80s sitcom dad than a ruthless villain. But Robert Foxworth has the voice and the gravitas to overcome that. My name is Braley. Look at this lineup of season 8 killers that we've covered so far. Dang, if I don't want to see all of them again. The last time we touched on this sort of international spy territory was Season 5's Identity Crisis, but I'd argue that Grand Deceptions immerses us in its world much more successfully. People complain about this one being boring. I find it dull. But I don't think so. There's a great thing about Columbo that makes it different from any other show. For the first half hour, we're in a completely different world each time. Does this even seem like Columbo? Dancing between a paramilitary training battalion and fundraising for a think tank? With a little civil war sprinkled in. Only after this novel new setting is established can the lieutenant make his entrance. Not every episode pulls it off as effectively as this one does. It begins with the foundation of success, General Paget, a revered figure, Braley carrying out his schemes and his affair. You'll never know. But by the end, the Foundation and the General's reputation will be in tatters. Braley is exposed as a thief and a murderer, and the General does find out about the affair. This total destruction of the world that the killer had formerly dominated is a common feature of the Richard Allen Simmons era of the show. Deceptions is directed by Sam Wanamaker, who directed the first Simmons era episode, the Bye Bye Sky High IQ murder case. The villain has a giant walk-in safe, like Try and Catch Me. Columbo says this, We have to face that now. Echoing his words from Columbo Goes to the Guillotine. That's something we both have to face. Guillotine's composer, John Kakavas, is also back, delivering another memorable and distinctive score. Columbo tells General Paget, And I certainly will be back. You can count on it. Just like in the previous episode, Sex and the Married Detective. I'm going to be back. Uh, you can count on that. It even features a fish-out-of-water scene where Columbo wanders off at a strange institute, like the Psychic Institute or the Sex Institute. Other Simmons-era staples include an ironic comment after the murder. I think we just lost one of our men. No, I never felt better in my life. I think it came out suitably, don't you? There's also the moment where Braley tries to wipe up the mud, recalling Brant frantically wiping at the soot. We even get a moment where we think the killer's alibi is going to be blown. Happy birthday, Jack. But then he's there all along. Beat up. 
If you don't like seasons 7 and 8 of Columbo, you probably won't like this as much as I do. But dig deeper. That's what we're all about here, baby. Because Grand Deceptions is a goldmine of amazing moments. The little rant about mud. Green mud and black mud. Wet mud and dry mud. And then this. My wife. That's Mrs. Columbo. That slays me. For a villain often derided as stiff and uninteresting, Braley has some great, well-written showdown moments. The episode really highlights these important battles, building up a relationship between Columbo and Braley that's a symphony in false camaraderie and suppressed rage. You have my confession. Well, I certainly understand that. The shrunken head scene at the Foundation has such effective escalation, so many story beats, that it could almost be a one-act play. I guess we can say this fella, he's a lesson to all of us. Columbo lays it on thick, acting like he's leaving, bursting back in, says another goodbye, Why again? Braley closes the door, then Columbo comes in again. Look at this slow burn, hands on hips. Each showdown between these two is a seminar on how to write the show. When Braley opens the door and sees Columbo, he looks horrified, and the lieutenant beams with joy. Well, this is some surprise, sir. The colonel tries to usher him out, but it's one more thing after one more thing. Except but then, do you mind if I used your washroom? Lieutenant, I do have an engagement. In the final confrontation, we get a nice callback to the I Ching sticks from before. The wordplay is fun. Why would he walk on his toes? Why would the police be looking for him? And the way the scene builds on all their previous discussions brings this satisfyingly full circle. Like the shrunken heads. The simmering animosity is finally laid bare, leading to one of my favorite lines in the entire series. Better be toy soldiers, sir. Don't patronize me, Lieutenant. Now, the final clue here is the deal with the box of books versus the box of toy soldiers. People always gripe about this. How do you get the deliveries switched like that? We've already seen that Braley is a man with serious connections. I think he easily could have arranged this deception, even made the shipments himself. It's not that important. What is important is how the final clue busts Braley's alibi of setting up the Civil War diorama. The alibi is built up as absolutely central to the plot. He mentions it to Columbo right away. Well, I played with toy soldiers, setting up a gift for the general. The general mentions it. Frank Braley did that last night. Braley says it again. Well, I enjoyed myself with the general. And it's mentioned again. But the books without the soldiers? There goes the big surprise. An ironclad alibi. And think about it. Once Columbo has proved what Keegan knew about Braley, and all the blackmail, lies, and arms dealing have been exposed, that alibi was the only thing that would keep the Colonel safe. Busting it creates a rock-solid case. The Civil War diorama is thematically central to Grand Deceptions as well. We start with a pan up from it, and end with a pan down to it. We see the flash of cannons and the cries of men as we pan across it. And of course, Keegan's fate is mirrored by the soldier toppling over. When Paget says heartbreak, we zoom in on a general on horseback, foreshadowing the general's own real-life heartbreak. And the source of it? His words... Flesh and bone. Echo Adams when beholding his wife Eve. This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And of course, we get the fun touch of Columbo himself appearing on the table on the Union side. This one's on the side that we want. Braley, meanwhile, represents betrayal, treason, and rebellion, and the scene depicted is Cemetery Ridge, considered the high watermark for the rebels, the turning of the tide in favor of the North. It hardly makes any difference to the battle, Lieutenant. Already seems to be lost. The diorama is literally the battlefield on which the episode's plot is played out. But the episode includes some outdated history. Brace yourself, it's a Civil War rabbit trail. General Paget's statement. Pickett's charge. On orders from General Longstreet. Half a day late, the battle's lost, Longstreet's fatal flaw. Is a product of older, lost cause Southern historians, who wanted to shift blame for the South's loss at Gettysburg away from the commanding general, Robert E. Lee, who was a hero to the old Confederacy, and onto his subordinate general, James Longstreet, who dared to criticize Lee after the war, and further dared to become a Lincoln Republican. Not too long after this episode, the 1993 movie Gettysburg, based on Michael Shara's Pulitzer Prize winning 1974 novel, The Killer Angels, largely rehabilitated Longstreet's reputation. I don't believe my boys will reach that wall. 
And yeah, there's me as a youngster next to the Longstreet statue at Gettysburg. I walked the field depicted in this episode, a cool moment for me. The general saying that Pickett was carrying out Longstreet's orders rather than Lee's is also indicative of his diminished stature and poor judgment. He trusts his wife, who cheats on him with Braley, who's stealing from him, and he trusts Keegan, who betrays him. Guest star Stephen Elliott gives a heart-rending performance as a man well past his prime, but there's a dignity and inner strength here that makes you really root for him. The revelation that he's been fooled on so many levels is one of the few truly sad moments in the series. And note the echo here. Braley brazenly admits to trysting with Jenny. Do you really want me to admit how many times she's made love to me? Just as Dr. Collier boldly admits to cuckolding another Stephen Elliott character in A Deadly State of Mind. What do you want? Confession that your wife and I are lovers? The channel is called Echoes of Columbo because of my theory that the old episodes are often echoed in strange and unexpected ways by the revival era shows. One of the first examples, the military school for boys where the victim dies in an explosion in By Dawn's Early Light. Boys will be boys, Lieutenant, but someone's got to turn them into men and the military school for men where the victim dies in an explosion here. Columbo is even introduced in the same way, crawling around on the ground searching for clues. Peter Falk is usually criticized for making his performances too broad and silly by this time, but his performance here almost undercuts that. Well, sir, it's a policeman's question. We expect to get our answers. We get a special sense that his silliness is an act put on for the killer. Look how professional he seems when he's alone with his men in the flashlight scene. How stern he is with the general's wife. Don't make me stop you, man. And how the mask comes off in the last scene. We really don't like one another. We go from his quiet compassion with the general and his wife to the very comical scene at the funeral parlor. The police. I'm the police. You can tell the police. And I love the changing seats, Braley's suspicious glances, and the guy playing Keegan's old friend is really good too. The quartet of Columbo, Braley, the General, and Keegan form a strong backbone for this episode, and I already mentioned Major Tanzer as a good supporting player. But I also like Braley's secretary Marsha, whose outfits include broad shoulder pads and this interesting hashtag cardigan. Other standouts include Mr. Martinson, the guy who says patriots. Think of ourselves as patriots. Sergeant Winnick, who seems like a good guy, and the coroner. Clarence, who's really dumb and gets his diagnosis wrong both here now I'm going to give you four final words, Lieutenant. And in guillotine. I'm going to give you this one as an accident and you can count on it. The only performance here that isn't rock solid, sadly, is Jenny Paget. I don't know if it's her warbly delivery. Lovely indeed. Enthusiasm unbounded or the way she expects sympathy when she really doesn't deserve it, but she's just not for me. On the more comical side, the three guys from the training battalion are hilarious. Here I be! The episode stays away from making specific political points, so I'll just say that with these doomsday prepper type guys, and all the shady proxy wars waged by the government, little wars in secret places, the plot of Grand Deceptions seems as relevant today as it was in 1989. There's so much to discuss here, but this is getting long already. So here are a few Columbo quick hits to round things out. The New Era Dog gets a quick heartwarming scene. The director of photography is named Robert Seaman. The general does a one more thing. I almost slipped my mind again. This is like a get smart bit. A think tank. This is a think tank. That's what it is. What do they think about? If they ever get the TK-800 out of the country, we're in a lot of trouble. Uh -huh. There's only one thing that bothers me, Chief. What? What is the TK-800? Here, Columbo's cigar gets shorter from one shot to the next. Here, the papers disappear and switch positions in Columbo's hands. I could go on and on, but hopefully I've convinced at least a few of you to give Grand Deceptions another try. Most of you will probably still rate this one poorly, but calling this a great Columbo episode is, for me, a hill I'm very much willing to die on. I'm being diddled.